So let's open to the book of Luke and we'll stick mostly in Luke because I wanted to uh, reiterate that the baby we remember at Christmas is also the saviour that we remember at Easter. So the book of Luke starts, gives us the, the, um, the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth and John Baptist. Then we get the account of Mary being told that she will have the Saviour. Then um, we get to chapter 3, where it starts talking about the genealogies right at the end. So in verse 23, so Luke three twenty-three. So Luke himself makes this connection. It talks about John the Baptist's birth, Jesus' birth, and the events around that. It shows him growing up a little bit. And then he says in verse 23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, goes through the genealogies. And then in chapter 4, And this same Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So Luke points out, This baby I've been talking about, by the name of Jesus, he grew up. When he was about 30, different sort of things started happening. So a quick survey of the life of Christ out of the book of Luke. So we see he gets baptised in Luke 3, 21 and 22. Um, And we see the voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So there's absolutely no doubt that this Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. People audibly heard that voice. Some of those didn't believe. So it's, it's not how you hear. I went through a series with the Sunday School. All the different ways that God has shared his message. Because we often say, well, if only this would happen or that would happen. Yeah, but God's tried all of that, including audibly speaking, and people still won't believe. So we see he was baptised. Then we see in Luke 4, verses 1 and 2, we see his temptation. He spent 40 days in the wilderness, tempted. Reminds, always good to remind you how he overcame those temptations. What was his answer to Satan's temptations? It is written. Are you reading this every day? So that when you're tempted, you can say, it is written. Then we see in Luke 5, he called the disciples. Uh, Let's have a quick look at verse 27 and 28, just to see an example of that. Luke 5, 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of customs, and he said unto him, Follow me. And it was his call for all of of his disciples. Come, follow me. And Levi left all, rose up, and followed him. Then a lot of chapters talks about the miracles that Jesus performed. Again, adding weight to the fact that he is God, God in the flesh. Of course, he healed the sick. He gave sight to blind people and hearing to the deaf people. And you go, oh yeah, one I find interesting. He made maimed people whole. So that's like our war veterans that come back without half a leg. God put the leg back. Jesus put the leg back on. That's what it means to be maimed. Of course, um, he rose people from the dead. There's at least three occurrences where he rose people from the dead. 
um, think of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, Lazarus and Lazarus, Lazarus, I think it is. He was four days in the grave. He was bound and yet he came forth. So he must have floated. <laughs> Not only did he raise the dead, he also controlled nature. Oh, we can remember the coming of the seas when they were trying to cross the sea and he was asleep and the disciples were panicking. And he said, peace, be still. And we, he also, we also see him casting out demons. Um, he also preached. He did a lot of preaching. We have a, a, quite a bit of record of him preaching. Let's go to Luke 8. Luke 8 and verse 1. It came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So that he is Jesus. He went round preaching. And you'll see that he was fervent about that preaching. He, he, it had to be done. He sent out his 12 disciples on at least two different occasions to go and preach. People need to hear. Um, again, in my Sunday school lesson, that was the conclusion we got to. It doesn't matter how they hear, they need to hear it. And it's our job to keep sharing it. We need to keep sharing that gospel. Some will respond in faith and others won't. And that's what the parable of the sower was about. It's our job to be the sower, not to be the soil inspector and say, no, nah, that's a hard soul, I won't preach the gospel there. It's your job to preach the gospel. Let's jump over to Luke chapter 12 and we'll see the message that Jesus emphasised when he was teaching the lost people, the people who didn't believe yet. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. Um, so in... Verse 1, we see that there was a numerable multitude joined together. Okay, so it's just a mixed crowd. And verse 4, and it says, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, Fear him. So to the lost, he says, don't worry about the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, because they were the guys pointing fingers and say, if you believe this Jesus, you'll be cast out of the temple. Jesus says, don't worry about them, because they're just humans. They have no power. Worry, instead, fear him who has power not only to kill the physical body, but then also to cast into hell. So fear more that person who has eternal power, that, he, that has eternal consequences. And that's the challenge for unsaved people. When we share the gospel with them, a lot of them will excuse and say, yeah, but my wife, or yeah, but my husband, or yeah, but this, or yeah, but that, because they're fearful of the physical. The challenge is, hey, they're just humans. They need to be saved like you do. You get saved first, and they might get saved later. Fear Jesus Christ. Fear God, because he's eternal. These guys, they're just temporal. So the challenge to the lost is fear God. Be fearful of him who is eternal. Then further down in Luke 12, down to verse 22. This is saying to his disciples, so to us as Christians, those who already believe. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, 
and the body is more than raiment. So for us as believers, the physical is not important. We tend to focus on the physical. I don't have enough money for this. I don't have enough money for that. I'm feeling sick. Where am I going to live? How tall am I is another example that he, he talks about. How, what, what of you can take thought and add something to your statue? It's physical things. Don't worry about the physical things. Focus on the spiritual things. So Jesus preached. So you can imagine the disciples... They had heard about this baby that was born, the shepherds and the wise men. They had spent time with him, watched him do miracles, watched him preached. And they're thinking, they're thinking, this is King David's son. He's the king of Israel. He's going to be king. And that's what they're thinking. That's their bias. But he wasn't ready to be king yet. He was Abraham's son, an Adam's son on his first coming. He needed to fulfill those two prophecies about Satan being bruised and about the gospel being made available to everybody. So imagine their surprise and you can see it when we read it. They just, it did not compute at all when he, when he corrected them and he said, wait a minute, my real purpose is... So let's go to Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and he said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he, the Son of Man, shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Verse 34. And they understood none of these things, went straight over their head. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. But as you keep reading, after the resurrection, they went, oh, that's what he meant when he said exactly those words. So Jesus came for that specific purpose of dying, of going to Jerusalem, being scourged by the Romans, being crucified, being separated from God the Father during that period of darkness to pay for our sin. And that's why baby Jesus came. And we can see in Luke 23 and 24 that he accomplished that purpose. And like I said, we remember it at Easter. So Luke 23. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Jesus died like he said he would. But then we see in chapter 24, verse 5. And they were afraid and bowed their, down their faces to the earth. And they said unto him, unto the, and them, the angels, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again, and they remembered his words. So not only did Jesus die like he said he would, he rose again from the dead like he said he would. In fulfilling of all those Old Testament prophecies, a lot of the prophecies are about the Saviour, the coming Saviour. 
Yes, there are prophecies about the coming king, and we'll get to that. But when he first came, he was coming to be that saviour, to fulfil the promise to Adam and to Abraham. So let's have a look at those verses. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, just to reiterate. Genesis 3, uh, 14 and 15. So this is part of the curse on the serpent. So within the curse, there's this promise. Uh, 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, that's the seed of the woman, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So even within that curse, there's this glimmer of hope about the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. And that's fulfilled in the resurrection. Satan thought he'd won. And then Jesus said, no, you didn't. I rose again. Um, and then Genesis chapter 22. And verse 18. So there's a, a number of passages throughout Genesis where God is making a covenant with Abraham and saying all these things that he will do. And this is one of those. Genesis 22, 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And Galatians explains, well, that seed is Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth are blessed. Every human being can have that salvation that's available. And in Romans, he talks about how we're the children of Abraham because we're children of faith. Abraham received righteousness because of his faith, and we are the same. So the, the only person that I found in the New Testament who notice that emphasis instead of looking at the promise to David being on the throne, being the king and remembering the saviour is Simeon when they went to the temple to um, dedicate Jesus. Uh, so Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2 when they go to the temple there are two people who are mentioned one of them is this old man named Simeon. Luke 2, 29 through 32. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch... No, it's Acts. Acts. Luke. Sorry. Luke 2, 29. There we go. Now, okay, so Simeon's talking... Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. So Simeon focused on the Saviour. And notice how he realised that it was a light to lighten the Gentiles. It wasn't just for the Jews. Jesus is a Jew and he died for all the Jews, but he died for the whole world. He's a light unto the Gentiles. So the baby we remember at Christmas is the same man that we remember at Easter. And we need to remember that he was born so that he could die. 
So we're going to sing a song now about Born to Die. It's not our final song. There'll be a bit more narration before we finally wrap up. But this song fits in here quite nicely. So Born to Die. This one will just be up on the screen.